I'm Edner Sessin, director of the Helix Center. Uh, before I introduce the participants, I'd like to say a few things about upcoming programs. Uh, we are going to have a weekend uh, on um, around December 1st, 2nd, 3rd, uh, devoted to the relationship between science and art. So we will have scientists, artists uh, working together and we will also discuss what is called STEAM education. Uh, so that's in December. Prior to that, some of the round tables we are working on are illusion of knowledge, sleep and memory, uh, some, a round table on emotions, mind, ours and others, and a few other things that we are working on and we will put it up on our website and uh, send you emails about it uh, as we have them planned. Today's roundtable, Complexity and Emergence 2, Visions of Cosmic Order from Particles to People, was uh, proposed to us by uh, Tyler Volk, who is a professor of biology and environmental sciences at NYU. The other participants next to Tyler is William Grassi, he is an interdisciplinary scholar, academic entrepreneur, and social activist and author. Uh, next to him is uh, Tim Maudlin, who's been here a couple times before, who is a professor of philosophy at NYU. And next to him is David Greenspoon, astrobiologist, senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. And on the other side, it's Ilya Temkin, professor of biology at NOVA and research associate at NMNH. Thank you. Well, we're supposed to each say a few words about our interests. So, um, I don't know, do we, do we get over here, maybe? Uh, David or? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as was mentioned, I'm an astrobiologist. Astrobiology is um, inherently a multidisciplinary endeavor, as the name implies, astronomy and biology, uh, and now many other disciplines as well, um, trying to understand really the potential of the universe to um, produce life uh, and what, what environments that may occur in and how we might search for it. And my own entree into that is as a planetary scientist, I uh, actually do climate modeling of other planets using similar tools to uh, what we use to uh, try to model the, uh, the future climate on Earth. Um, and, and a part of that is the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, it's uh, connected in interesting ways with astrobiology and Recently, I've um, just uh, completed a book that's been about a four-year project, uh, which is uh, looking at the Anthropocene Epoch, which is the name that some uh, geologists and now other people have proposed for our current time of Earth history, which is characterized by humans as a geological force, looking at that through the lens of astrobiology. In other words, for someone who thinks about planetary transitions, and the relationship between life and planets. Um, what does this moment in Earth history when um, this species, uh, this um, arguably new kind of phenomena on the planet has become a major factor in uh, planetary evolution? Um, so that's, that's what I've been focusing on recently and it dovetails in interesting ways with this sort of the whole story of cosmic evolution. What is happening on this planet now and what are what do uh, human beings really represent as a factor in planetary evolution? That's my entree to this subject. Okay, should I, uh, we go around? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess um, I'm, I'm sort of on a different, uh, my specialty is foundations of physics. So I'm mostly have, have been looking at trying to understand fundamental physical theories. So uh, the connection, I guess, to this particular topic would be in the connection between the base level physical laws and emergent laws in the sense of patterns 
fairly predictable patterns that are, appear at higher levels that are predictable without knowing all the details of the microphysics. Um, the, insofar as I have have much to contribute, it's that it's it's kind of I mean just to appreciate what a mystery it is why that should even happen. There's no particular reason why a law governed microphysics should give rise to any interesting macrophysical structures that have complexity, both complexity and predictability. So there's a kind of we take it for granted because we live in a world like that, but we don't appreciate how curious it is that we do live in such a world. Um, so maybe I can contribute something there. <laughs> So I, I got interested in uh, the subject uh, 30 years ago, writing a dissertation in a religion department on what it would mean to treat the modern scientific cosmology as a mythopoetic creation story. And um, I sort of fell into this um, uh, rabbit hole at that point. Um, uh, so I, I'd sort of been doing what, what we called then uh, the epic of evolution what, or the new cosmology, what people today often call big history. So I'm involved in the exegesis of big history. What does it mean? And how do we interpret it? And there, so I'm sort of play with lots of different interpretations at different levels. And um, of course, part of that is to figure out you know, the big questions. But also, I'm really interested in big history as, as a kind of a pedagogical um, um, endeavor, because uh, we've learned so much about the universe in, in say, the last 50 years, and, and, and about ourselves, and human origin, and our psychology. And, and of course, all that has also fueled a tremendous change in the way we live, the Anthropocene, as you mentioned. So for me, putting it all together, uh, both uh, as a sort of metaphysical question, but also as a pedagogical endeavor is what's inspired my work over the years. So I, I, most of my bread and butter work has involved the global carbon cycle and climate over the years, uh, energy systems. Uh, but the work on the global carbon cycle took me from the macro planet down into molecular levels. And I also had a strong interest in in patterns, Tim referred to patterns, patterns at different scales and how pattern at one scale can influence another scale and how sometimes similar patterns can reappear such as binary systems or, or certain shapes such as spheres. Uh, and I was, is, this began because Ed invited me to a panel in uh, April which I could not go to, but I said I have this new book called Quarks to Culture, and Ed said that would seems like a good uh, topic for a panel on complexity and emergence in May, so let's set that up. Uh, and, and what I, this, this, and you have the handout in case some things get referred to that everybody could, could talk to, because I think tonight physics is going to come up and biology is going to come up and culture, culture is going to come up. Uh, and uh, these figures are, from, are figures are from my book. And what the basic idea was that if you go down into the body, into cells and into molecules, one can be going down back in time in terms of the origin of the types of these things. So the cell had to come into existence before you can have a multicellular body such as an animal. And a molecule has to come into existence before you can have a cell that's made of molecules. Now, not the cells of our body or not the molecules of our body, but as a type of, of system, there had to be a buildup from something small to large, or there was a buildup, and it doesn't have to be, but science has uh, discovered this, a buildup from small to large. And then I just said, oh, I wonder if one could count, I wonder if one could use the idea of merge of combination into new systems from small things, one could use that sequen sequentially as a number of steps and distinguish fundamental levels uh, of, of who we are. And not just up to our body, but then we are part of a social system too. So I was just wondering, can one do that? And then that led me into the, these 12 levels that I talk about that each have, the next question would be, each must have had something special that came into existence or emerged 
in order for the next level to happen that could not have happened at a prior level. So there must have been something about the molecule that was different from what the atom was that, that the molecules required to form a cell, a living cell, that the atoms by themselves could not have directly gone there. And the same with the fundamental um, particles of the standard model of physics. They, there was some paper in science years ago that somebody said, uh, you, you don't model bulldozers with quarks, that there's these intervening levels. So that's been well known, that, that there's been, uh, the, the physicists talk about the, the onion, the la layers of the onion, and the biologists have had their major transitions of evolution. And what I was merely doing was saying, oh, I, we could, one could actually see them as part of a a way to do big history in terms of certain levels. And it relates to things like emergence, but that's, that's the topic of the panel. So I'll just uh, leave, leave it at that. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist and primarily interested in the general mechanisms that uh, lead to uh, the formation of the patterns we see reflected in the history of life. Um, it is clear that evolutionary processes occur at multiple levels of biological organization from molecular to all the way to ecosystem, ecosystemic uh, levels. And the patterns that we observe in nature, they are the outcomes of the synergetic effect of different uh, events that occur at all these different levels. So to me, prior to even attempting to address the question of how, the, how these processes result in the patterns that we observe and describe as evolutionary biologists, we need to be very clear about the ontology of the structure of the organic world. And that's where, to me, the question of the hierarchy and the level structure of um, the organic world comes in. And it's, it's not a surprise that it's by itself, the, um, the level structure has been long recognized. Every single textbook in biology begins with the description of the hierarchy of the, of the living world, starting with molecules, leading to the formation of subcellular structures that then make cells, cells make up tissues, and so on, until you get to the organism. Organisms make up um, populations that interact with each other in an economic way in, um, in the context of ecosystems, communities, and so on, up to the all-encompassing biosphere. However, if uh, you look very carefully at um, this stereotypical structure that everybody is familiar with, you begin to recognize that this hierarchy of scale, where you simply order biological entities in the order of the smallest to the largest, it's probably a sufficient way to maybe describe different types of biological entities, but it doesn't provide an explanatory power to explain the processes. Because at the same level, there are entities that cannot be encompassed in a single uniform hierarchy. Evolutionary biologists like myself, who look, try to look more seriously at these questions, recognize that there are two types of biological individuals that fundamentally differ in their nature. Some of which we refer to as systems, where um, the relationship between entities that comprise the system is um, based on the energy and matter relationships. And an example of that would be, for instance, a, uh, a cell where um, different organelles interact with one another in some kind of economic way to make the larger system go. They're basically part of the whole system. On the other side of the spectrum, there is a, a system of information transfer which were recognized as a replicating entities where the relationships of them or the, the mode of incorpor incorporating into the larger entities is not the energy and matter relationships, but the matter of in inclusion based on the ancestry. These are genealogical entities which are better described not as systems, but as historical lineages. And the evolution occurs as the interplay of between these two separate, however, overlapping hierarchies. So an example of that would be, so within even our bodies, there's this duality of interactor and replicator systems. So our body is composed of two fundamentally different units, is the soma and the germline. The whole purpose of, so, of the germline, or our cells responsible for reproduction, is only to transmit the, the information from one generation to the next. So you, one can be a perfectly happy organism living without leaving any offspring behind. 
So you'd be perfectly functioning as a system in an economic way without ever reproducing. So it's just the second aspect of our nature as well as any other biological system at every level to be able to replicate in a proliferative way so that processes like selection or sorting can take place where the evolution results from. So to me, this is the most fundamental question within evolutionary biology is to see how you can understand the processes that impact systems, the hierarchy of systems at one level, or the so-called ecological, sometimes the economic hierarchy of life, and how it reflects in a synergetic effect at the um, different levels in the uh, historical or genealogical hierarchy that we perceive as uh, what we described in systematics and taxonomy as the tree of life and the patterns that uh, that are being of that uh, of that tree that are shaped throughout the history of life. So one of the problems we're going to have talking about complexity, uh, let alone um, uh, an emergence, is that um, we're dealing with all these different scientific disciplines, and there's no there's no there's no numeric measurement of complexity. Uh, it's not just the size of something, it's how, how diverse it is, perhaps, or, or I'll, I'll, I'll focus later perhaps on how much energy it consumes, uh, how much free energy flows through the system. But, but I think it's really important, a lot of people don't understand, I know, I'll be curious what you, I, I talk about the great matrix, we're talking about hierarchies or scales, and we do have some interesting scales. We have a scale of, of time, chronology, we have a scale of size, uh, we have uh, measurable scales of uh, free energy flow through a system, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is an amazing scale, which is very important in our level of reality. Um, and a sound is a different type of scale. Interestingly, humans are, have a much broader, um, many orders of magnitude uh, uh, auditory capacity than we actually perceive visual light. It's a very small range. And, and I think then we can go to inductive or, or uh, scales. Or let's say there's a scale of uh, information and ingenuity. <clears throat> Or you know, the, the, there's a scale of uh, of sentience and consciousness, or when of course the scale that we're talking about is emergence uh, of complexity. So, so the, the, those are those are I, maybe there are others. I don't know, but those are kind of ways of orienting us to um, all phenomena that science describes. So we're, we have, um, uh, I think, some interesting. It's not just uh, anything goes. There's a lot of restrictions about what what science can can understand or or feel i call it the great matrix by that you mean the system composed of all these different scales no i think everything what's can your, be what's your, everything what's your can, great matrix oh the great matrix is uh, time space energy electromagnetism sound uh, uh, right and so then, those and, so w would you but some of those seem like subsets of others. They are, for sure. Electromagnetism is a form of energy, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So is sound. Mm -hmm. um, so some might be and, more primary. And, and, and we live in this amazing little thermodynamic eddy, eddy in the universe where complexity runs uphill. And, and so we have, a, we have this, you know, uh, if it weren't for that thermodynamic eddy, eddy Right. Uh, where the Goldilocks conditions were just right, we wouldn't be here talking about it. And, and so how do you see that? Um, so, so the thermodynamics run uh, uphill, meaning you can have local reduction in entropy and, and so, increased complexity, as long as there's a global increase in entropy. And, and, and any, anytime energy flows through matter, it creates order, creates uh, information. And so that's what the weather is, right? It's a way of dissipating energy. That's what a hurricane is or a tornado. And when it passes through solid matter, it can also have memory. And it can also compute and can make re reproduce itself. And so um, the, the weather, the, the gas molecules, as soon as the energy flow stops, they just dissipate. But you know, life has achieved this uh, internal telos to uh, you know, survive, reproduce, uh, and create life more abundant and extravagant. So, so for me, the, 
the, uh, the, the, the fundamental physics of the universe is uh, as long as there's energy flowing through matter, uh, we have a, a possibility of increasing complexity. So I, so that, right, so I think that's key, the possibility of increasing complexity, but it might not be an, an inevitability. Absolutely not. And it says nothing about how that complexity uh, is going to, going to evolve or what it's going to be, but the possibility exists. So that's a kind of fundamental level. And, and most people don't get it. It's very counterintuitive, but if, um, uh, um, uh, Eric Chason at Harvard and Tufts, astronomers done some really interesting sort of back of the envelope calculations about how much energy flows through a system. Let me just put it out there really quickly. Take the sun as a unit. Of course, it's really big and it, it's really it puts out an enormous amount of energy, but it, but a, a, a photosynthesizing microorganism is about 500 times the energy density flow of the sun when you normalize for the mass and the, su and the time frame. Uh, a mammalian body is about 10,000 times the energy density flow of the sun. Our brains are about 75,000 times the energy density flow of the sun. And by the way, our brains only work on about 20, 25 watts of energy. Right, so our body is working about 100 watts of energy, and if you take all the energy that we use outside of our bodies, uh, as a result of first, first uh, fire mastery, then agriculture, then fossil fuels, we're, we're you know millions of times the people in this room are, are consuming energy millions of times that that of the sun. So it's very again when normalized for the mass of the system. Mm -hmm. So energy is part part of the story of complexity and most people focus on the information side of it it's informationally driven but you don't you don't get the information without the energy flowing through matter so that's a that's a sort of fundamental physics point that well, Tim might want to say more about that yeah I'm not sure I um, let me try and make a point about information in terms of entropy maybe and and, and then maybe I can ask you because I'm not quite sure what you have in mind by energy flow. So one way to see the complexity, this is an example, I guess, of, of Sean Carroll's, but it makes the point. Complexity is a really hard concept to get a good grip on. And people often try and equate it with a concept that you have a better grip on, like entropy or something like that. Um, but if you think about the, there's a standard example of increase of entropy where you take coffee and cream and start them out where the cream's just on top of the coffee and then you wait and it slowly diffuses and or you stir it, right, uh, which would be introducing energy in. But even if you don't introduce any energy in, it'll slowly diffuse. Um, if you stir it, it goes through a phase where you have this tremendous complexity. You have the tendrils of cream that have interesting shapes that are intermixed with the coffee. But then as time goes on, it eventually becomes bland again, right? It just becomes a mocha brown uniform mix. That's the, that's the maximal entropy state, right? It's not the maximal complexity state. So you started from a very uncomplex system, and you go through a sort of complexity maximum, and then it tails off as time goes on into, a, again, a very uncomplex system. All the time, entropy is going up. Um, so the conditions for there even to be complexity or how you quantify it or what you mean by it, I think, are very difficult. I'm not sure why you would need energy flow to get complexity. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what you think of the connection there between energy flow and, complex and increasing complexity well, is if one, I... Well, the one thing about biology... so I, So and i'm not and there's things i'm not comfortable about with the information i mean i understand you know that's a whole discussion i i tend to take a very almost architectural approach but one thing about the origin of life is is that now and i'd be curious uh the transition from the physics and chemistry to the to to uh once you have living cells the way I see it. You now have systems that require the import of matter and energy into them and export of wastes, which you do not have with an atom, you do not have with a molecule. They can be relatively static structures. And 
so you so to have life you do you do need a field of either molecules that contain chemical energy in the environment or radiative energy with photosynthesis. Uh, and so that does have to flow, that does have to flow. That was something, of course, you understand, you know, I know you know that, but that was something what you were asking then what that transition meant. But I'm, I'm sorry, because once, once you have a system that requires inputs of matter and energy and exports waste, it seems to me then, then biological evolution almost follows logically from that because since these creatures are replicating themselves, they can't just grow forever. They split and they form two cells. Now they're, they have to be, they're, now they're in competition inherently because if one is in, importing a nutrient, that's depleting the nutrient in the environment. So there's a depletion of the energy from the environment if we talk about matter containing energy. But, but, but living things also could need matter as matter. They need the carbon atom to, to structure other molecules. So it's not just energy. They actually need certain kinds of material uh, building blocks. And once you, but once you have something that needs imports and exports, you get biological evolution because now there's the deep depletion in the environment from the nutrient import and there's putting out toxins of, as waste, because the waste, these creatures are getting rid of it. So they are causing detrimental changes to the environment, setting up a competitive, so to speak, field. You can also have cooperation in there among organisms, of course, which is important for the evolution of the eukaryotic cell. But it sets up this field. Now, so I, I do have this overriding question. It, it, that's, in a way, a different kind of dynamics that have been born from the physical chemical dynamics. Now it didn't, it, it didn't, it's not just coming out of, you know, the sky coming down, but it seems like it's a fun, it's, it seems like it's, it's different enough that biological evolution is, is, is different enough for us to really think about what that means. And now you can have combination of biological structures. I know, David, you want to chime well, in I think, I think the, um, an import, another important um, concept here is homeostasis because it's not just enough to um, have those energy flows and as you say, the flows of, of matter that maintain them. I think Eric Chason's um, observation that energy density um, seems to uh, conform to this sort of hierarchy, or seems to be, to be a characteristic of this hierarchy is very interesting. The hierarchy that, that you've kind of named in, the, in your introductory um, statement um, does seem to carry with it this uh, also hierarchy of energy density, but I don't think Eric has um, answered the question of why that necessarily needs to be. It's sort of an observation. No, no. When you name this hierarchy that, that Tyra has very well described, and then you look at the characteristics of these different entities, one thing you can observe is this, this um, energy flow density is really markedly increased at every higher level. Ex but all, exponentially yeah, increased exactly, at every exactly. higher level. But, but it's also a characteristic. Some of that energy, some of what it needs to do, some of the point of that is to um, create a homeostasis so that the flows of matter and energy that allow that uh, structure um, can, can persist. A, a disequilibrious homeostasis. Yes. No. So it's not a causal, it's not a, uh, it, it's not a, it's a causal factor. It's a necessary, and again, en energy flowing through, through gas spontaneously creates order. Yeah, complexity. But I, I wanted to maybe try to make one step back because we have discussed so many concepts that um, and the relationship between which is not always clear. We we'll started with the notion of complexity, right? So I wanted to maybe get back to that a little bit, discuss it in a little bit greater, um, greater uh, detail. Wouldn't be let's just for try to simplify things a little bit. So let's um, pretend that we're just looking at a system at one part, comparing two systems at the same organizational level. So it's made from comparable parts. So we have a very good mathematical language to describe um, structures in the form of dynamic networks that interact with one another, uh, where different parts interact with one another in some non-trivial way. We have, um, we can describe as topology, the strength of the relationships, define as modularity, the overall topology, and by doing that we can compare to a system in terms of, and there are some numerical ways of assessing complexity at that level. The difficulty comes in when you start looking at hierarchical systems where an element uh, of a system is a 
um, is in itself a complex system of a different level, mm -hmm. then you would you can you can argue that the system is more complex the more hierarchical levels you have because what you yet I think and, and overall could you just clarify when you say hierarchical. Uh, do you mean, I mean ne nested? I mean nest. I, I mean nested composition. Because hierarchy sometimes people use hierarchical to mean like a tree structure. Yes, or not but, hierarchy of control. No, I meant specifically physically nested. Nested in, in, in like a Dan McShay sense, because I know McShay talks yes, about exactly. one yes. way of one form of complexity is 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 um, numbers of layers of nestedness. Yes. Right. And, he, and I saw that he has right. a paper in your new book. Um, yes. For yes. example, but that's what you're talking about when yes, you say hierarchical. But specifically about one particular type of hierarchy when you have nestedness. Okay. Because I think that's a different in scale, something you referred to early on regarding that, that scale is important. Scale is important because the discontinuity in that scale, that's what creates the discreteness of levels. That's why we can talk about the levels as ontologically sound real thing rather than just pure our conception of some things being a little smaller, some things being a little larger. Because I think nobody would argue that when two individuals interact, it would, um, like two humans would interact, it would be correct to say that cells of one interact with an individual person of another because these are not comparable entities with regard to this scale because the rates of processes at different levels are completely different. So you cannot really, so that's why when we look at the a dynamic system, it can be only composed of the elements of the same hierarchical level because they are, if you engage in the, in the energy and matter relationships, it can be only um, among entities that are within the same uh, structure. Yeah, I'm totally into that. Where then these these entities at these different scales have certain kinds of relationships uh, that they're capable of. Yeah. Like, so we are capable of using light and sound, of using remote remote sensing, which cells, biological cells, they can be responsive to light, but they're not actually, as far as we know, you know, communicating through, like, say, a linguistic modulation on light and sound. So the way I, I see it is that it, it's, it's not only the birth, what's, what's key is not only the birth of these new scales of size, but these, these entities or systems have new kinds of abilities to relate. And I think what you're saying is that they tend to relate to entities on that same level. Yes, yeah, and no, you, Tyler, refer to with your approach of recognizing these levels. These are the fundamental jumps in these levels of organization. Something that is was sometimes referred to as major transitions. Major right? transitions in the, in the, in the bio bio biology. biologist. Yes. Yeah. It's not about how the system, once it's already emerged, how it starts working with this having multiple level structure. But your focus seemed to be on the or emergence of these levels in the first place. Right. Right. So which is it's, it's a different story. They've, obviously, it's really you have to have these levels emerging first prior because now we're looking at, we're faced with the already in existing system of these levels that have, must have emerged sometime through history. But it's a different question of how these levels have appeared in the first place, which is... So it, it, I, it, go ahead. And I, I mean, I'm just not sure I understand. Um, I understand the notion of level. I can make sense of the notion of levels, I think. I don't see why you would think that uh, only things at the same level interact. So um, suppose a I'm a biologist and I'm looking at, I don't know, otters. Um, and otters are able, I think, to pick up rocks or somebody is able to yeah. pick up rocks and smash. Yeah. So the rock is yeah. at a really low level yeah. of complexity, yeah. right? Yeah. But it yeah. interacts with this biological organism yeah, and it's right. important. So, yes. you know, I, I, it would be a nice world if, if, as it were, the levels just kind of, you know, thinned themselves out and only interacted. Right, right, right. But there's all right. kinds of interlevel right. interactions. Yeah, yeah, this is a really well, important, and, this is really and important some point. particles and atoms interact with uh, mutations. But yeah. it's a different kind of interaction. Maybe yeah. there's a certain kind of constructive or engage, engage engagement that only happens at the same level. Right. Obviously, we you know we get hit by um, you know high energy protons and you know it can yeah. damage our cells. But that's different from communicating with another organism. Yeah, maybe the otter is picking up the rock to maintain its homeostasis. Or uh, but in the but, system, but that's about, I don't think a rock and it's and an otter they are at a different level. Yeah, in terms of they're all uh, maybe. 
complexity of composition, yes, they're at a different level. But I'm not putting them at different levels because of their complexity. They're at the, because they're at the same level of interactions, they belong to the same level. Because at the same time, the fly is an organism. It's a level of an organism. It will interact with a human. Because human is an organism. They're at the same level of an organism. But obviously, you can argue that the fly maybe is more simpler than, than a human. That doesn't make them... But it would right. be wrong I, to I, say... I, so I would take them as, as multicellular or I would, yes, I would, yes, I would treat them at the level of multicellularity. Level, yes, multicellularity. Level of, yes. But, so, but it would be wrong to say that an otter... Uh, interacts with an ecosystem because ecosystem that's some a level that's encompassed not in all of us all of the otter deals with so otter would interact with other abiotic and biotic elements in its own environment but not with ecosystem as such okay. what or about the fact that a human being is a multicellular organism but now we know with the microbiome that we're not only interacting with unicellular organisms but that in fact um, we uh, our nature is uh, <laughs> integrally um, composed of unicellular organisms, which are themselves inwardly composed of things that at smaller levels. So uh, it gets complicated, doesn't it? That's, yeah. that's where it gets complicated with, um, um, with the question of what leads to the origin of levels. Because if you look at a say, human organ composed of multiple cells, if you try to look at an individual cell as an independent organism, which it is not because it usually does not live under natural condition and devo devoid of being part of a of a body it would not be but in the early origin of multicellularity that was the mode of emergence of that multi organism level of problem you can talk more about this but the emergence of multicellularity yes it, you, it has to be a fundamental step where um, there was this <laughs> next level emerged. But I think with regard to interaction with human with its uh, microbiome, we are at the same level as this organism. They, we, the organism, they're multicell, maybe multicell and unicell organs. They still can interact. They can eat each other. It's well, maybe not, maybe not multicell, uh, unicell organs will eat multicell. But, uh, but it's, a, it's an organismal level. It's um, complexity and level um, are not necessarily can be equated. I think you can only compare the complexity of entities that are at the same level. If you can compare between levels, then you what have to see mean, how many levels they have. What do you mean compare? Have, uh, what do you mean by compare? When you said you can only compare two entities at the same level, what do you mean by, what are you trying to well, you, you don't use uh, particle physics to do economics. Oh, oh okay. So, you I mean, mean, you know. You mean to have the discourse. I mean, I mean you mean, have you know, the discourse you, to, you to know, but, figure out the, the, but, but, the scientific relationships. But, but I think it's important to note that the adjacent levels often do have things to say for e to each other. And that, that there's, a, there's a difference between complicated and complex. So the example I like to use is a car is a really complicated thing. But we sort of know how to build it and how all the pieces work together. But a traffic jam on the morning commute where, where everybody's driving along and a little variations in somebody's speed starts replicating and all of a sudden it's stop, go, stop, go, that's a complex phenomenon. And complex complexity is a whole science of its own, and it inv and all the most interesting things in the universe are complex adaptive systems, where there are lots of different interacting parts, and there's some uh, freedom or possibility of uh, of, of uh, things happening differently. So. Co complexity as a term of, of science is really different than complicated. And a lot of what science is, is trying to make things that look complex turn into complicated problems. But now there's a whole, a whole yeah. bunch of, of, of phenomena yeah. that we study, some of them very simple, like flocks of birds, mm. which some can be described mm. mathematically, some not. Mm that are complex, and I think that's an important... But what you just described as the relationship between the complexity of a car structure and the traffic, which cannot be decomposed uh, and, to be, and be explained in terms of the car parts, that's the exact, I think, um, example of a comparison between different levels. I mean, in some way, the traffic jam is simpler because it can be mathematica mathematicized, um, and, you know, by as little units, and people write equations for it and do modeling of it. Where a car, yes, it can be understood, but it's it to me the multiple levels of a car. Of course, the car jam is made of cars, that's so what, that's, that's why what it's I'm a. It, the yeah, car but I think what you just said is going to be much more true in ten years. 
there about traffic jams when there are no more when, no, they're when, when their human drivers are no longer a part of the equation. Right. Whereas now, uh, you know, th there's a, there's a complex neurological, uh, sensory, uh, yeah. uh, uh, reactive component to that. Where uh, it's interesting to uh, to note that soon there'll be traffic jams that are probably just as complex <laughs> for different <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so, so so here's something I'd be really so we haven't gotten into culture yet, but I'd be really curious about how what you what uh, how you think about this idea, how you how you all think about it from different angles, and particularly from a general principle. So lots of people for years have been talking about cultural evolution, which is like biological evolution, not by having a genome and not by having a phenotype genotype, but by having properties of propagation, variation, and selection. So the automobile manufacturer can make more cars as a propaga as propagating. They're not self-propagating yet. Uh, but but they, then they put out variants. Uh, scientific theories can do the same thing, put out variants, and then it's selected in a field either in one's mind or in, in, in society. Now, there's, there's certain pushback against that from some of the social scientists. No, 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 you don't want to make the comparison too rigid. But, but there's, a, there's really a, sort of a tidal wave of literature happening in, this, in, in, in culture evolution studies. Uh, we're simply saying that there's been a, the way I would put it, sort of a rediscovery of, of these triple processes of propagation, variation, and selection of pattern that occurred at the beginning of the origin of life at the prokaryotic cell and occurred again at some point in human evolution. I'll take it to be definitely by the thick time, sex tools, and probably, you know, we think language. And I think there's also a similarity between the, the uh, amino acids, 20 amino acids, build, being able to build the complexity of proteins, almost an infinite complexity of proteins, and human phonemes, a few units of speech, being able to build almost an infinite number of words. I, th I think there's kind of a parallel between this uh, uh, sort of element going to complex, being within the cell as the genetic an amino acid system and simple elements being complex in the human language system corresponding to the beginning of a propagation variation selection process in biology with a propagation selection process in culture. So I'm curious is then if, if, if there's been a rediscovery as, as these levels of organization have built up, if, if suddenly the prokaryotic cell, which is using biological evolution, so is the eukaryotic cell, so is the multicellular organism, and so is the animal social group. And then with the human, what the anthropologists call the metagroups, where groups can be not visible to each other on different sides of the mountain, but they're still linked in a culture, if that began a uh, um, a propagation, variation, and selection process, again, that means there was a, dis a, a, a discovery or a rediscovery of the similar pattern, kind of a principle. Uh, yeah, but the, so there's a difference, though, and, uh, between biological evolution and cultural evolution. And that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's because we learn. Yes, and, yes, yes. And we pass on what we learn more yes, yes. or less to the next generation. Yes, yes, yes. And that becomes an a, a exponentially growing process. Yes, so, yes, yes. So yes. individually, you know, we're not all that smart. We have um, a, a person bite limitation, if you will, yeah. about how much we can know and how much we can knowledge and know how we can contain. But you put us together in this quote unquote super organism. And and uh, we're just much we're, faster. We're, we're, we're on this well, exponential. Let, don't let don't, don't to me. I, I mean, don't run us individuals down too much. Um, well, not you. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, I mean, I do want to mark a difference here because I think the analogy, the the wonderful thing about the theory of evolution, the original biological theory of evolution, wasn't just that it was replicators with variation and selection, but that it was random variation that you didn't need a teleological, you didn't need a purpose, you didn't need an aim or a design, and this could all just be happening randomly. Now, hopefully, okay. once you get people involved, 
they're honestly not, the chefs really aren't just randomly throwing stuff <laughs> in and seeing what happens, right? They, they come to have some understanding of what they're aiming at and you get intentional behavior. Right. Uh, they that, want people you know, to come back to the restaurant. Which is, <laughs> yeah, which is gonna make the whole thing much more efficient, you hope, and much faster and much more powerful. So I would be a little and, leery of- And it seems to, it seems to be, but would, would you, but leery of t the, stretching the analogy too much, but I would like to say it's, it's more than an analogy at some deep level, it's the rediscovery of some of these triple principles, but how they're manifesting. Because well, even the even the chef can't determine whether those people are going to like. Yes. The you dish. use the term uh, you use the term intentional behavior, and I think that's an important term as far as the, this difference you're trying to describe. But then we can also ask, what do we really mean by that, and where does intentional behavior come from, and one idea, and I don't think anybody really knows, but one idea I've heard about that um, for, and, and you know, this is above my pay grade, but some of you guys might know more about this, but, but, but for how the, uh, the mind works and how ideas emerge and how intention, whatever that is, comes out of this, is that there is some sort of potential, uh, uh, sort of a uh, Darwinian type process, or uh, at least process that's sort of analogous to that going on inside the brain where different associations and ideas are kind of competing and, and uh, uh, emerging from some sort of a process. And so it may be that some of these uh, qualities that you're describing um, as this sort of universal pattern emergent are, uh, pattern emergence are going on and contributing to this, but that it's really going on as far as idea formation and indeed the formation of intentionality, however that works inside our brains. Well, mo most of my brain was pretty empty when I was born, and um, of course it went through a prolonged period of childhood um, uh, dependence. It grew three times from, right, you know, that's about how big the brain grows in childhood. And so I, I, everything that fills our brains uh, is largely, including our language, is largely acquired through the social and environmental network. And so for me, the brain's a really interesting thing, but it does nothing without oppositional thumbs and environment and, right. and a social social environment in particular. So, but so, so, with what they, 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 so to me, the, what the, the real miracle is how, how does this stuff um, uh, the, how does the environment imprint itself into our brains, and how do we, how do we? So you know, the, you could talk about all kinds of different emergence. There's, there's uh, evolutionary emergence. There's uh, developmental emergence from a single cell to a, 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 an adult body, or there's, there's um, a functional emergence. Like all, all the cells are working at the same time. So is the physics, right? On um, what is it like? Forty trillion cells in our body. About half of them. Uh, another uh, as many bacteria, and and then you could even talk about intelligence emergence, and that can happen to an individual. It can happen to a species, and I think we um, can it happen to a planet? Can it happen? Well, you know, so that's a that's the question. That's the Tehardian, Pierre Tehard de Chardin, the uh, Jesuit priest, one of the one of the patron saints of religion and science. Um, but to continue with, with to go back to David and t try to tie it into you, what you said is that yes, we're born uh, with with these you know baby brains and we we suck up a lot from the environment and one of the things we we pull up is is the ability to be intentional or, or at least or at least use that language to people. Oh, I thought that through, and I now decide this. That's that's in a way a propagation, variation, and selection. Well, there's a, uh, uh, let me again make a kind of analogy yeah. here in terms of even, so it's certainly true that you speed things up by as it were virtual processes in the brain that make selections out of different, I, I'm deciding what to do and I think about five different possibilities and I try and project out what will happen and make my choice on the basis of that. And those are only the ones you're consciously aware of. <laughs> right, but, but you do need yeah. a, I think you, right, you need a distinction. And think about chess playing computers, right? So originally, really the chess playing computers were sort of blind variation. I mean, they just did massive searches of all possible move sequences, which because of combinatorial explosion, they could had a horizon. Uh, but in some sense, in some sense, they considered hundreds of millions of possible sequences of moves. And if you ask an expert chess player, he'll say, I considered four. Uh -huh. You know, I looked at the board and I said, 
maybe it's this one, maybe it's this one, maybe it's that one, and 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 then they focus down, right? There, it's a different. It's really a different. And, and we kind think of they process. could not have, and even unconsciously, we think they could not have done hundreds of millions. That's right. Because we don't know the unconscious. That's part right. So but, you know, it's it. it, it I mean. There, that, right, so, so, that ability to, it's true there's a kind of variation there, at least they're looking at a, at a mm-hmm. variety of possibilities and selecting among them. Um, but there's also a, a lot of interesting things going on that they can look at such a small variety of things and apply their cognitive mm-hmm. you know, resources to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also to be really true to biology, the variation is also really not also, from biology, we know it's not entirely random. Also, we know that some parts of the genome can mutate, mutate more readily than others. It's uh, it's predictable. We know that some mutations are filtrated to the level of the phenotype, not also through some random manifestation, but there are some constraints by the organism level. So it's not also entirely random. But I think, in general, the metaphor of relating cultural evolution to um, to biological evolu- evolution, it's I think it's both a useful analogy, and there is some truth to it in a very general sense, because if you define evolution in a simply even even just basic Darwinian terms, you know, Darwin didn't use the word evolution at, at first, he just used descent with modification, which simply uh, in modern language would you can translate it as a, as a fate of information. So in that sense, uh, evolution can occur in any system, whether information transfer from one generation to the next, as long as you have some sort of replicating system. So human culture, what ad- it, it adds to it, just adds to the new mechanism of information transfer and modification, which is through our culture. And because that method is quite radically different, you can transfer information not only to the next generation, but kind of laterally, almost like bacteria do with their lateral gene transfer. You can recover lost information from the past, and there are all sorts of ways how information can be transferred in ways that are not found in biological systems. So it certainly lends to some novelty and intentionality as part of it as well, some creative intent of individuals, so we should not discount those as well. But uh, at a higher level of maybe so- higher social structures within the human society, there is some element of maybe not necessarily selection, because I don't want to draw analogy to like fitness in biological systems. I think it would be too maybe too untrue. Uh, but there is some sort of a sorting. You have variants, and they're being by some either random function or maybe not. They're being sorted and distributed where some persist, some do not. In that sense, it, it, it does hold. It but does, but wouldn't it you say work. there's some kind of fitness, you know, maybe about the, you know, a bottle or everything that we design uh, that you, you don't, you're uncomfortable with using the word fitness? I don't personally... A little bit, I'm a little bit uncomfortable because you want to keep it to biology. Because in biology, because, because in biology fitness has very specific meaning is the ability to replicate itself more. Maybe having a better uh, form in, say, in an element of human design shape, uh, it might not necessarily translate into a higher rate of its reproduction. Um, right, but some like in terms of manufacturers. R- right, so the the, it, the, the the better way of having the typewriter in terms of ergonomics did not was not the way the typewriter work. I, I just don't know. Okay. It can be generalized. Maybe it is true, but um, but I'm. But, I and you, and you do these. I'm, I'm actually one of the few people in the world who uses a Dvorak simplified keyboard, <laughs> which was designed in the 1930s by an efficiency expert uh, based on the frequency of the letters and the two and three letter combinations to, uh, to minimize finger motion. And, uh, but we're all locked into the QWERTY keyboard, which was designed to make us type slowly because the machines would jam. And uh, uh, Stephen Jigul has a lovely essay yeah. about this, about, you know, in evolution, it doesn't have to be optimal. It just has to work, and then it gets fixed and stuck. And so every time you look at your computer, you should think, my god, this is a, in, an icon of how brilliant we are and how stupid we are, because the keyboard is literally pretty stupid. In biology, they talk about they, yeah, they talk about the uh, uh, not optimizing but satisfying. Satisfying, that, you know, right? So uh, anyway, that's that's the and uh, this is probably very true to human culture as well. Some things that persist might persist for reasons other than being the best serving the needs. So, for instance, uh, some years ago, I embarked on a project trying to apply biological methods, maybe very um, naively, trying to reconstruct the phylogenetic and evolutionary tree of musical instruments. We discovered very unusual interesting patterns that was had to do with uh, looking at um, 
cornets from the late 19th century and up to like through the middle of the 20th century. And it turned out Cor that some cornets. of the cornets, cornets. the uh, trumpet-related musical instrument. And it turns out that some of the uh, trends that were found had to do not specifically with a better design of valves and and the way horn is structured overall, but there were some purely economic, pa uh, economic reasons for developing the industry in some ways because some people mm -hmm. Uh, patented uh, certain ways of making it, preventing other people from doing it. There were other social forces had nothing to do with optimizing a particular um, particular item, human, obviously humanly designed in a very creative way, item that was very consciously designed, but it could only develop in certain ways because higher level social structures that, like a patent agencies and maybe I mean, some some individual players, some jazz players that use some of these instruments, they preferred some of the more archaic designs, just purely for aesthetic and historical reasons. They didn't really care about maybe a better playability in some way. So mm -hmm. there are many more, um, I think, uh, aspects to yeah. human to ways of uh, uh, variations being sorted in human culture. That's why I didn't want to s define it as a specific uh, fitness function, because fitness re applies only to one thing. Aesthetics is an interesting um, thing to bring into it. I mean, because as you say, you know, th there are obviously some important and interesting analogies between cultural evolution and biological evolution. You've, you've named several of them. But, but yeah, when you start talking about fitness, um, I mean, it's very easy to say um, when you're talking about Darwinian evolution and even sort of neo-Darwinian evolution what the what the sort of sort of goal is. You don't really need a goal. It's just the um, those entities that do a better job of propagating themselves, they win. They're fit. But when we get to cultural evolution, then you do have to start saying, well, what is the goal? What do we want? It's not necessarily true that uh, the goal is for each of us to have as many offspring as we want. In fact, we're starting to realize that there's a whole other level of planetary fitness in which that's actually bad. So uh, you know you, you can't help but but start to say okay so so what really is the goal? But the uh, when you get to aesthetics, it's very interesting because you could say well this is something that isn't really a part of biological evolution, except it is because you get into sexual selection and you get these ridiculous. Um, structures that are among the most useless and the most beautiful um, parts of nature, which are simply, um, which have this whole other goal. <laughs> well, but it's still the same goal, but it's, it's attracting a mate, not uh, anything that's, that's more, quote, useful for. And, and I agree with you there, because especially what you mentioned earlier, that it all comes down to actually just the way human brain functions, to which I also don't have as much expertise to, um, to speculate about. But. Um, Levi Strauss has one um, interesting comment when critiquing the purely biological transfer of the notions of evolution to the culture. He said, well, the, but the X doesn't reproduce, doesn't make another X. So it happens to in the mind of its creator conceiving the idea of it and what happens to these ideas, how they're manifested in the objects. So you can't necessarily kind of even look at those coordinates and say, well, that's how they evolve. No, they're just the maybe, just some, maybe imperfect reflection of the processes that occur in the human brain and the evolution at that level. So I think just looking at the cultural artifacts as such, as divorced from the workings of the human mind, I, th I don't think it's a very legitimate pursuit in that way to view cultural evolution like that. It certainly can, just looking at organismal um, features, can allow you to reconstruct phylogeny maybe in, in, a, uh, in a quite um, um, precise way. But it's not telling you the mechanism of how evolution has occurred through speciation variation. So in that way, you can also tell something about the way human culture works by looking at some patterns of similarities between artifacts and different aspects of human culture. But to really understand it, you really need to look at the function of the mind. So, I mean, I, I've been um, uh, doing a lot of reading and research right now for a book I'm writing on how this applies to finance and economics and investing. And, and what, one of the things that's, uh, you know, is that we all have these hunter-gatherer brains. And you know, we, we live in this incredibly advanced civilization, but we're still, on, on the psychological level, we have a lot in common with, with you know, uh, humans uh, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. And, and, and so our, our thinking is fast and slow, we're predictably irrational, and, and um, you know, we're, we're driven by uh, all kinds of variable hormones in our body. And so um, th there's, uh, uh, it, it, another question is how how did a, a complex global scientific civilization possibly emerge 
from such stupid primates, um, um, some of whom um, are president of the United States recently. Well, so, I, I wonder, do you really think that we live in an incredibly advanced civilization? Um, no, I, I, I think we have the potential to form one, but, sir, but I would say that, you know, as a basic prerequisite to say, to, to define an advanced civilization, you would have to have the ability to uh, to uh, be uh, imagine that we are a, sort of a part of a sustainable civilization, and I'm not sure we're actually so, there yet. I, 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 I won't, I mean, there's the, 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 the normative moral side of it, and then there's just the fact of it, and I'm just talking about the fact of it, that our world is so different than one that people lived in a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. Yeah, I, agree, I agree with that, but I also think that uh, it's possible that, I mean, uh, uh, trying to describe Manhattan to uh, say one of the um, hunter-gatherers who lived at, uh, uh, at Pinnacle Point uh, 190,000 years ago, which may, who may have been among the first uh, Homo sapiens sapiens uh, in southern tip of Africa, would be very difficult. Um, humans have an amazing ability, uh, capacity for reinvention. They were probably genetically pretty similar to us, but uh, maybe lot, that's lot more stuff now. Yeah, yeah, but maybe that difficulty of them imagining our world is as difficult as it is for us to imagine what an advanced civilization would be like. And so, so yeah, do you think that how long before we get there? I'd like to know. <laughs> well, but this also, I, I, I want to see it. So when, when, when I hear you let's talk make it, about let's these make it happen fast, when I talk, David. Uh, when I hear you talk about these, these levels, yeah. Atoms, um, simple cells, complex cells. Multicellular. One question that I can't help but wondering is, okay, what's next? Yes. The next level. Yes. I, I read something recently, actually, when I was just starting to write my book that I just finished um, by Isaac Asimov, written in the, in the 70s. Um, just a little short essay where he talked about this, this hierarchy of, you know, uh, atoms to molecules to viruses to full bloom cells to multicellular. And then he talks about the, the uh, multi-organismic, and there's some examples of sort of full-blown uh, superorganisms like, uh, you know, insect colonies and so forth. And then he, he talked about we humans, we have leanings towards that superorganism. Um, we have some identity with the tribe, with the group, but we're not quite there. We still, mm. and, and I, to me, that was really powerful. I thought, and I, and I say this at the beginning of Asimov my had it, huh? Yeah, well, that, that in a certain way, we're stuck between the individual and the superorganism. And in a way, that's one way of encapsulating our predicament here as human beings trying to have a sustainable society because there are ways in which we need to function as a superorganism, but we're not inherently good at that. Um, so, uh, I, I, I found that powerful because it's just one way of trying to place our current cultural difficulties in the context of what we're talking about here. I, you know, I, where, where do we fit, and what's next in that? I, I'm I'm really scared of that uh, analogy. Because I don't, of the I don't, Borg? I don't want to be part of a super I, organism. I, I, I mean, cells, you know, cells, unicellular organisms were looking out for themselves. And in multicellular organisms, the individual cells are easily expendable, yes. right? Um, they, they can be sacrificed, you know, quite regularly for the good of the, of, of the, and I don't want to live in that, mm. in a society that's going to mm. throw a bunch of us away. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's what we're, I don't think that's going to be progress, right? There's, there's going to be progress when every person, uh, nobody lives in poverty, when no individual, you know, when people have the resources are more or less spread much more equally than they are, and everybody has dignity, and everybody has access to decent things. I, that doesn't look like a super organism to me. Um, it, it looks like a rational designed system, right? <laughs> um, and and I, again, rationality, it's kind of important when rationality gets in the game. It's rationality just isn't in the game of evolution. And we're aiming for something else. We're aiming for something we've thought through and that has moral principles underneath it and so on. Well, maybe, it, that, maybe I mean, it's, we're getting maybe... I don't want to argue about semantics here, what we mean by superorganism. I certainly agree with what you just described as, a, as important goals. Yeah, me too. It's an interesting question. Are, are the, uh, the bacteria within us that are, you know, basically are, are, there, there are organelles within us that are pretty much the same as bacteria, but have found some way to live in harmony in, in, in an uh, organism that we identify as ourselves. Are they unhappy? Do they know that they're not bacteria? Um, and Maybe the secret sauce to go from uh, organism to uh, 
healthy planetary superorganism is exactly uh, some of what you said. Maybe the eliminating the poverty. I mean, this is why it's not about it's not strictly a biological step right. to if, right. it, to go to the superorganism. If we're going to get into intentionality and rationality, maybe that's what's missing to to bring us to that next step. And evolution's just not predictive. I mean, there's nothing strange about evolution leading a system into a complete disaster. But, but as you were saying, cultural evolution is different because we, we, we have these scenarios in our mind. Right. And I, I, I think we're not thinking about the future enough as a... Uh, yes, making people smarter would be a really good idea. <laughs> uh. So, so one, one of the things yes. that, one of the things that uh, this little discussion brings out is that we, we have all these values like human rights um, and they're not written into nature. They're invented by humans. Or the, the traditional religious worldview is that they're, they're dictated by you know, a creator, though each human has innate value. And so the scientific and post-enlightenment world is trying to figure out how to ground uh, concepts like human rights, which is, uh, you know, it's a great invention, but it's a fiction, just like money's a fiction. It's not really real. There's no, no other species exchanges matter, energy, and ingenuity based on, and on symbolic yeah, systems right, of value, right? The right? symbolic systems so, are invented, yeah. So, 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 um, so one of the ways to ground um, uh, uh, our, 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 our intuitive sense of the innate value of a human human rights is is in is in what Whitehead thought about Alfred North Whitehead about the idea that uh, emerging complexity uh, 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 creates uh, a, a, at every stage a greater freedom greater possibility and that there there is a kind of there are kind of thresholds and that that, that the human is a particularly intense threshold in which uh, the complexity of the cells in our body the social networks the, we're kind of a nexus of of uh, uh, of uh, of a lot of freedom, a lot of choice, a lot of possibility. I don't think mor morality is really an issue for uh, prime, other primates, so, well, but it is for us. Do you think that the planetary scale that uh, could be to overcome our fears that of uh, being subsumed and being less free so, could be more free? So is that your personal I, I, I hope, or do you, you think it could in, be in, even... In this sort of Whiteheadian metaphysics, there is a telos to the universe, and that telos is, is a, a greater complexity, greater freedom, greater creativity, right. and greater beauty. So For him, beauty of the aesthetics is a really important point. So, so I, I think you, you can, it's not, it's, not, it's not fully worked out, but I think you can, you can start to define things that, uh, you know, there is a real difference between uh, killing bacteria versus killing humans. And, and there's a qualitative and quantitative difference, and you can't measure it, but it's, uh, it's not just a self-serving bias uh, the, uh, on, on my part. But otherwise, uh, human rights is, uh, you know, the, and, and you have definite ideas about what they should be. Of course, evolution doesn't care at all uh, about, you know, our future in that, in that level. No, uh, ev biological uh, evolution. Right, ev yeah, biological Culture. evolution has no moral. I mean, I would just like to register my Descent. objection to th this fictional, I, I think there are standards of, objective standards of morality that have to do with equity and fairness and so on, that by thinking hard, you can figure out at least some of them. I'm not saying that there's a rational resolution to every moral dilemma, but I think there are some moral principles, you know, that chattel slavery is just objectively wrong. Uh, but it, wasn't, would, but it wasn't for most of human history. No, it was wrong all through human history. <laughs> People were doing objective, you know, objectively morally horrible things through most of human, and we're still doing objectively morally horrible human things. I don't think these are inventions. I think they're discoveries. I think we've, we've made moral progress by discovering or registering the fact that slavery was wrong, that discrimination was wrong, that discrimination against women was wrong. I mean, there's a, <laughs> it was just, unacceptable morally. It, it, it wasn't right back when people thought it was okay. It's not their thinking one thing or another that makes it okay. 
Well, well you know I'd, like, I'd like to agree with you, uh, actually, but I don't. I mean, I wish I wish I could agree with you. Well, <laughs> so uh, you are saying there is a moral evolution? Yes, I think there is. There is some oh, moral, certainly moral evolution. Then. But but I think it's directed. I think our our moral behavior has gotten, in many ways, better. Um, I would because agree. because it's through the recognition. Yes. I mean, through moral suasion. You think about the the civil rights movement here was a matter of getting people, the majority of people, to care about a minority on purely moral grounds, on saying, look, this is just, this system is just wrong. Maybe I'm benefiting from it. So it's how do you wrong. think that might play out in the future as we have tendencies, which you brought up, that are frightening tendencies, maybe for, for the subsumption of the individual into the, into the superorganism ant, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, anthill. I mean, do, do you see that, this, that we are going to need to either invent or discover, we're, we're going to still have to be doing that, like there's more to come? Well, I, sure, look, I think there are a lot of, just as people could live in a society with chattel slavery and somehow avert their gaze and avert their mind from it, even though they knew. I mean, Jefferson knew, these people knew they were doing something wrong at a deep level. And, but but right. we have a, right. lots of self-rationalization and a lot of blocking, psychological blocking mechanisms to keep us from recognizing how terrible certain things we are doing. You know, hopefully as time goes on, we will, you know, people will start to see, you know, they'll look back at our society and say, you were so primitive because they will have actually put into practice things that if we think about them in a calm way, we'll say, yeah, we're really, our society, I mean, as I say, we live in a society where there's such a thing as the working poor. That is, someone can be employed 40 hours a week and still and work be, hard and, and, and yeah. still be, there's just no moral principle that should allow that in any society. I mean, if, if, if you're a socialist, you think people shouldn't even have to work to have a, you know, to live. And you can make that argument. That's gonna be a harder argument around here. But even now, on both sides of the political spectrum, how could anybody say, yeah, somebody can be out there working 40 hours a week and still not be above the poverty line? So I, I, I just wanna point out again that, that, that animals and trees and plants don't have moral choices. Right. We have moral choices. So now we need to talk about how did morality emerge in human evolution? And and again, we have hunter we have hunter gatherer brains. We're all tribal creatures. We, you know, we it's we harmlessly divert that into sports or other things. We less so harmlessly divert that into, you know, ideologies and nationalism yeah. and yeah. ethnic chauvinism and so on and so forth. But yeah. and and so there there's two ways to. Approach our our moral. One is what's functional, what's best for the individual, for the group, and the other is principled. And 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 so you're taking a principled position, mm -hmm. and I, and there's reasons why that's good too. And we certainly both agree that there's moral evolution, but but you almost sound like you 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 like the God there with the Ten Commandments, say, somehow it, imprinting in our biology. Um, uh, 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 rules against no. slavery and infanticide and a like god no, 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 biology. No, no, I like how you're a... merging the two things here. <laughs> there, there was an old art. There's a you know. If you go back to Plato in the Euthyphro, he gave the right argument about this. Creating morality isn't something even God could do. God, God make. If you think God made, made, made up morality, then you're saying, all right, I'll have 10 commandments. Shall it be thou shalt kill or thou shalt not kill? Well, boom, pretty much six of one and half a dozen of the other, right? Um, because there's no moral principle, right? Then you think that's, then, then it's just an arbitrary choice, right? Then, then it wouldn't be a moral principle. But, but what about the fact that those societies that chose thou shalt kill, which plenty did, I mean, the, the, especially outsiders, right. then, then they didn't survive as well. I mean, there, there is kind of a selection process in in historical well, cultures. It's also true yeah. that the, 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 uh, the world evolves in ways, the reality of our situation evolves in ways that, that fundamentally change the moral landscape. There are more ch moral challenges we have now that people didn't have a couple hundred years ago. Sure. Um, there's a um, historian, an environmental historian, um, named uh, Jean-Francois Mouhot, French guy who wrote an essay um, called Thomas, Thomas Jefferson and Me, um, 
a couple years ago, where he talked about uh, Thomas Jefferson and slavery and how, as you say, he knew that it was wrong. But he said that Jefferson and his contemporaries lived with what he called a moral deficit because even though they knew slavery was wrong, they could not imagine um, how they could live without. Um, without it. And so they lived doing something they knew that it was wrong. And, 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 and he goes further that slavery was, was a big part of how they got the energy to uh, power their society. The way we get energy to power our society yeah. now, yeah. we know is wrong and it's harming future generations. Mm. This was not something we had to confront a couple hundred yeah, years ago point. or a couple thousand years ago, certainly when, we, when the world was functionally infinite. Now the world is no longer functionally infinite for us, and we are confronted with new moral challenges. And it's very complicated because it's not enough to just say, well, we have to change how we live. If you rode your bicycle here, you're fine. Um, no. Although I applaud it. <laughs> hey, I took the train up here. That wasn't too bad. But, but, um, the, um, but it's a global problem that we have to address globally. It's not enough to change our energy distribution because these issues of uh, inequity you were raising, uh, people in developing countries deserve a more high energy lifestyle than they have now because uh, the, you know, rural, rural electrification, being able to um, cook their meals without having to gather wood and dung that's going to cause them respiratory harm. There's a basic way in which they deserve and need more energy, and yet we all live in the same atmosphere, so it's our moral obligation not just to change the way we live, but to help them change the way they live. This is an entirely new kind of moral um, conundrum that humanity uh, has never had to uh, face before. So there may be moral, I, I agree with you actually that there are moral absolutes that we can at least search for, um, but certainly the landscape has changed so that there are moral conundrums we face now that people have not had to face before, and that may well be true again in the future, the landscape shifts. Sure. So have you thought of what that might mean for the individual, the, the individual psychology? Well, again, to me, it's part of this uh, trying to um, learn how to become um, a larger entity than ourselves, work together in groups in a um, functional and sustainable way. You may not like the language of superorganism, and that's fine with me if you yeah. don't, because it's really more of a metaphor than mm -hmm. anything else. But, but certainly, I think we can agree that, uh, you know, guided by uh, compassion and principles of equity, and some of these principles we agree on, that we have to learn. We're, we're faced now with a need to move um, into a mode where we can function well together in larger groups than we've had to before. And to me, that reflects this kind of hierarchy that you've described in an interesting way. But even um, without departing from you know, even the traditional biological hierarchy, human species is unique uh, in a way that it's the only species that exceeded the natural boundaries of its own ecosystem. We don't live within constraints of a given ecosystem. So for us, due to, to a large extent to our capacity of culture, cultural exchange, we occupy the entire globe. So our ecosystem is the entire planet. And, and I can entirely agree with you that because of that, that's the unique challenge. No other species at any other level had that, I would maybe say, moral obligation, but, but the kind of a global role in forming the future of its own environment. So in, in, in that way, it's certainly unique, even irrespective of culture, even though culture is probably what is responsible for the global status of our species. Well, there have been species, of course, in the past who have changed the planet and suffered the consequences of that. Going back to our famous, uh, our friends, the cyanobacteria who poisoned the whole world. <laughs> with the one oxygen That's right, it's a group no, of species. There have species. been, there've been <laughs> organisms in the past. And I think you can find examples of single species that have uh, done uh, major things to the globe. But at any rate, it's, in that sense, it's not a new conundrum. But, but and yet it is a new conundrum. But what's new about it, uh, we're aware of it. We feel this sense of responsibility. We are. Um, whether you want to call it evolving or changing, whatever word you want to use, moving into the future as a changing entity through new mechanisms. And obviously, we're not just doing that in some um, vacuum space. We're doing it against the backdrop of a planet, the evolution of which we have somehow suddenly found ourselves integral to. And so the, these are now, and this is you know my sort of fascination and really the subject of the book I've just written, that we're, we're not just talking about a change in biological evolution. We're talking about a change in planetary evolution that is coming about through this new level of, of um, 
if we can call it evolution, cultural change. There's one thing that intrigues me about that. Then the world, so, so yes, cyanobacteria, or what I like to call biochemical yeah. guilds, have changed the world. But then it's now in our minds, the reality. The, the carbon dioxide level is above 400 parts per million is in, well, not everybody's mind yet, but uh, hopefully it will be because it's, it's in the air and it's, it's talked and about. Our, and so, and our, so the world, our minds the way the have planet, caused that problem. Huh? Our minds have caused, our minds have that caused problem. the problem. So now there's and just, now they're starting to appreciate so that there's problem. There's strange <laughs> feedback Actually, between our, our minds and, and the it, planet. It wasn't, now, wasn't my mind and it wasn't your mind. I didn't invent fossil fuel consumption. I didn't invent computers. It was this distributed mind, and we're already involved in this larger collective, whatever you call it. And 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 uh, and I think economic markets are kind of interesting in that respect because most economists and investors would agree that you know it's got a mind of its own, <laughs> and if they could understand it and predict it, they'd be filthy rich until everybody else adapted, right? And so so we're we're already involved in culture and economics and 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 discovery and and this whole economy of knowledge and know-how. And, and language and everything else and and we're like we're like the bacteria in our stomach trying to understand wh what is this thing I live in I uh, always I always notice and I, I know nothing about economics and I'm really glad you're addressing this on this level I can't wait to read your book because but I always I can't wait to write it I, yeah <laughs> what are you doing here go home and write no they, they, I, I, I always notice uh, when I, I venture to the business pages um, which occasionally I do um, that the way the language that we use to describe the market it has emotions it has intentions we talk about the market is spooked or it's the market became afraid of this or the market was worried about this or the, the market was buoyed or <laughs> happy because of this and then the, the market the I market think, has bipolar disorder is this just a metaphor an easy way to describe something or are we actually describing some sort of it, we just we talk about it like a conscious entity and yet obviously it's some manifestation of our own individual choices and uh, <laughs> That, that's where my knowledge of this ends, is just sort of being, being befuddled by that. We're on the same page. But I, that's the, that's the, the emergence. Page. It's the emergence part of it. But I, I, yeah. I, I think, again, I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I would, I would be a little cautious about this emergence talk and, we're, and, and making it all sound so mysterious, because it seems to me we're missing, for, in the case of fossil fuels, there is just the blind greed of certain people who wanted to make a lot of money and didn't care, just like with the cigarette manufacturers and so on, they were doing something that foreseeably was going to be horrible. They didn't care. Now you can talk about the emergence of this, and you know, but th that's the problem, right? I mean, don't make it sound like it's this big, you know, thing. But it's not the fossil entirely. fuel industry is is. You, making money and they want to continue to make money. That's not the, that's not the whole you, story. You get no benefit from fossil fuels and the people who make money on it. You get no benefit. No, why? But well, I didn't well, say. Well, I didn't say that. I'm saying well, that the, 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 there's a there's a conscious they, they, a, a attempt which has succeeded to uh, make people disbelieve scientific results. Right to question the entire scientific enterprise. To think this whole thing is a hoax. And that's having terrible political, making it impossible to address this politically, which is the only way we can do it. Whether I had uh, have benefited from fossil fuels or not, and at what point it became clear the damage, of course, in the beginning, the, I can imagine people saying, no matter what humans do, we're too puny, right? Or the stuff coming out of my tailpipe can't possibly mean that, you know, there, there's going to be huge... Well, the greenhouse effect yeah. was not even yeah. understood. Right, you know, so there was, a, there was time, it, it took time to figure that out. In a rational situation, once you figured it out, there would be steps taken so, this, to ameliorate it. So and we're being global, blocked by that, and it's not by it's not mysterious why we're being blocked by it, right? But so, so I think what you're describing is absolutely true, but it's not the whole story. I feel like this global mind we're talking about, which is actually kind of dumb and slow, is figuring it out. And fossil fuels have been this wonderful thing. They they are a wonderful thing. I mean, we we discovered they that by they replaced our slaves. Yeah, they replaced our slaves. They replaced whale oil, which seemed great for a while, and then we realized that we did that a little too long. It did some damage that we wish we hadn't done. 
200 years from now, that's how we'll look at fossil fuels. We did that a little bit too long, and we did damage that we wish hadn't been done. They've been an amazing source of energy and um, if you look at the, the level of poverty over the last 200 years has gone down, 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 down. There's been amazing progress. Human um, uh, infant mortality is half what it was 30 years ago. There are a lot of ways in which this is the best time to be a human being alive. And a lot of that has to do That's for sure. with fossil fuels. Now, it's absolutely true that we need to change what we're doing. And a big part of the reason we're not fast enough has to do with the dynamic you talked about, about greed and people denying that and delaying it. For, so I completely agree with you. But the long story is is one of, we did this thing that seemed great, it was great, and now we're realizing that we need to stop doing it as quickly as we can. And part of the reason we're having trouble realizing that we, this global human mind, is because of this um, fact that we, we're not all on the same page. And in fact, some people are profiting by keeping us all off yeah. the same page. So I, I, just want, I just want to say that the, the people who work at ExxonMobil or wherever do not think of themselves as um, uh, e e evil. I'm sure they don't. They don't, and they, they have very they, few people they, do. They have exactly. <laughs> okay, and, they, and, they, they, and, they will and, stop and, me. Except for Doctor Evil. And so, what, what, so some so of them. Are. Okay, we will we will we will probably, stop probably. we will stop here and go to the audience for their questions. Okay, <laughs> you have to go to the microphone if you have a question. Just when we all start talking at once, he says, "Okay, time for the audience <laughs> <laughs> to ground us." But this is getting. Crazy. You have a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Gilles. I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I stopped doing that because of my uh, new passion for psychocultural development. So emergence in culture is really uh, the thing that uh, wakes me up in the morning, and I was really into it. This is really a rich conversation. Um, I have one question, uh, essentially about cultural development. And uh, you said something really interesting about uh, that I didn't get uh, before uh, about that if you um, um, add energy to matter, you create uh, complexity, right? You said something yeah. like that. And it's kind of interesting because then you bounce back something uh, that was said before uh, about uh, cultural development. I said there is a big difference and it's learning. We learn. And I was sort of like wondering if you could make a parallel between matter and a flow of energy creating complexity as f uh, fueling emergence and complexity in, uh, in the biological, physical world, and having mental structures that, of course, no, you, didn't, we didn't, you didn't talk about that, but they are mental structures, and they change. Um, and this flow of information, which is really learning, which is the information that's available and that a particular individual will also be sensitive to, able to read, would actually fuel emerging, I mean, Im complexity, creativity, and the emergence of new uh, mental structure. I was wondering if you could, uh, if you had like any ideas about what is actually happening when we talk about uh, cultural development or, or consciousness development? Um, it's too complicated. It's kind of uh, no, I, mean, I, I can I can talk. I mean, they, so I think uh, culture requires energy, mm -hmm. uh, just like all biological things, and. <laughs> And uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, great acceleration that we've been through in the last century from, you know, uh, three times as many people practically in my lifetime, uh, uh, much more consumption of fossil fuels, so on and so forth. I think that all requires energy uh, to, to happen. But I think I, I, I want to also say two things. One, in Chason's work, uh, Eric Chason, uh, he, he talks about optimal energy flows. Uh, so uh, if all the energy that we use outside of our bodies was going through our bodies, we'd all be burnt toast. So there, there are different ranges of optimal energy. Uh, uh, they often, in big history, they often use the term Goldilocks parameters. And, and uh, sometimes there are leaps or shifts from prokaryotes to eukaryotes or whatever. But um, 
but it, 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 in, in, it's all the same process, whether it's uh, single cells or human brains. It's, it's energy, matter, and ingenuity or information, information that contains ingenuity. And, and so uh, DNA is a way of coding information. Um, and what's more important than the information is it's information that does something. And so our brains are also good at rec uh, coding information and, and the stuff we remember, information that does something useful. And so, um, and then that information is exchanged between brains and across generations. And that's what uh, bacteria do it uh, by lateral genes transfer. But when you get into eukaryotic evolution and sexual reproduction and distinct lineages, then you have a different type of selection process, um, a more Darwinian. And it's not that Darwinian selection doesn't operate on our genes, it does. But we have this other way of evolving through, through collective learning, through symbolic language. And, and maybe the most important thing we invent are fictions like money or human rights or, or, uh, or, um, or religions uh, or cities. Uh, so the, the, I don't know if that answers your question, but there's well, My some... question was like, don't you think that there is a, 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 a correlation or a, at least like a, like a mirror image between flow of energy and matter fueling biological and physical uh, uh, evolution and flow of information within mental structures flowing the creativity oh. and, and complexity in the emergence of new mental structures. Well, so, well, you, so, you, so, so you could talk about information density flow, if, yeah, you, if exactly. you like. That would be a that's, nice, a term, yeah. that's a term that yeah, I sure. use, uh, information density flow. So humans are particularly amazing and, and now, of course, we're, we're, we're creating new information. We're drowning in data. So uh, one of the really interesting things is to look at the trajectory of uh, uh, digital information and, and plot it out against the, the amount of energy required to store that information. So I think right now about 10% of the electric grid in the United States is devoted to, uh, wow. to uh, maintaining computers wow. and, and computer data banks. And super data centers, and that, you know, if if like if the banking system goes to a blockchain, uh, that will that will require a new leap. If you look at the amount of, of, of genetic information that is generated, or the amount of information that they generate at CERN, so we're we're on this exponential leap of information, but it's it, it's not it's it, what matters is information that does something that has some exactly. ingenuity to it, and and that's uh, that may be lost. In the, in the in the jungle, as it were. Okay. And I'm okay with his question, just in terms of we 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 feed, so to speak, mentally on patterns of light and sound, and to some degree smell, but mostly in touch. But you know, so there is we are requiring these these inputs not just for the raw energy of the light coming in. I mean, it's not really helping my body. It's way too little that's coming from your. You're asking that question of, as I'm getting patterns of light and sound. So I, I'm in a very literal sense of his, uh, his question, uh, I, I do see that there is an analogy there. And then what we do with that, of course, is it's not just, it's inherent that we have to do something. It's not inherent. We have to do something with what he, he spoke in English to us. So we're already receptive to that. All right. One, one I kind of like the analogy. I, I just one to, last response, and then we move to the next question. I just want to add one more, uh, but probably just even more immediate connection. Um, I'm not a cultural anthropologist uh, to really provide a full answer, but as far as I understand, the um, part of the development of the um, human brain was in part fueled by the change of human feeding patterns and diets, especially with regard to cooking, which led to the extremely much more efficient than for any other organism consumption of energy. And probably at the level of individual organism, even before you start talking about some communal um, responses to the collective consciousness, so, so for at the level of individual with the development of the brain that will ultimately lead to the greater um, capacity of um, thinking processes, it, there was a 
um, definitely an influx of energy from the change of purely biological structures. So it has to do with feeding strategies, change in the feeding apparatus, the ability to cook, and related to that, utilization of tools. So it's um, so I think it's directly involved. Okay, next question. Oh, there are more. Uh, it's very, it's been a very interesting discussion, but uh, one, uh, and particularly in terms of the uh, question of energy and uh, and uh, ecology and so forth. But nobody mentioned uh, an experiment that took place about seventy-five years ago, which was a uh, an experiment uh, conducted by a rather small group, maybe a thousand or two thousand physicists, who produced an atom bomb. And the history of the science of this uh, uh, it really goes back to Einstein and Bohr and so on. So it was a long process. And they were uh, very conscious of the uh, ethical and moral possibilities about this, uh, uh, about this event. Um, uh, we don't have to go into all of the discussions that took place. And among the scientists, there were differences of, of opinion, but uh, generally those won the uh, argument uh, who said that knowledge and, uh, and uh, information is more important than uh, a decision about what the result or the consequences of this would be. Uh, of course, they were uh, under the pressure of feeling that the Nazis were developing an, uh, a, a bomb as well as we were, and that the Nazis, if they got got one, would be more horrible than if we exploded it. And they also thought that this would have a great effect on the uh, expense, expensiveness and availability of energy, because they thought atomic energy is uh, could, you know, we we know all about this. Uh, what, uh, but but, but this, wasn't, this wasn't discussed, and one of the reasons why I suppose it wasn't discussed is that they didn't know what the effects would be in the long run. They thought they knew what the effects would be in the short run, but not in the long run. And I still, uh, we still don't know whether this uh, atomic development, what the effects in the longer run are going to be. And so uh, I think that nobody has been discussing how, how we can find some way to be able to predict the future better, uh, not only in the stock market, which will make one of us richer uh, or not. Uh, because I think that's the real problem. We can't predict the future. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And we are still yeah. uh, living in the, or I am anyway, in the belief that the more we know and the more we understand about nature, our own natures and the uh, nature around us, the better off we'll be. But that hasn't been proven yet. <laughs> OK, thank you. Well, um, the, uh, you raised some excellent points. The, um, the Manhattan Project scientists, um, many of them were aware of what was um, going to result and were, and were terrified of it. Um, but as you said, they were more terrified of what would happen if they didn't do this and, and the Nazis did it. As far as I know, there was nobody uh, involved in the Manhattan Project, none of the scientists who said, we shouldn't do this, let's stop, because of what we're unleashing. There were, um, there, were, there were a lot of them that immediately afterwards became leaders in the disarmament movement, people like Philip Morrison. And um, it, for the rest of their lives, many of them, this was what they devoted themselves to, was uh, nuclear disarmament, because they uh, realized immediately that they had um, helped create something that was not really uh, a weapon in a meaningful way, but was a uh, um, global um, suicide machine, which it it remains. Um, and there was even they were even faced with the knowledge, the possibility that when they did the Trinity test, they might destroy the world. They there was some there was a, um, a calculation. They weren't sure. It, depending on the cross sections of some of these reactions, that they might fuse the entire atmosphere and at that moment destroy all life on Earth. They thought it was very unlikely, um, and they decided to go ahead with it. So I mean, I think uh, they were aware of these moral contradictions. They were choosing what they thought was the lesser of evils, and then a lot of them. Um, 
spent the rest of their lives working to keep, put the genie back in the bottle that they had helped unleash. Um, and we still live uh, under that threat in a way that I think people um, under uh, estimate for reasons that uh, have to do with your profession, uh, probably <laughs> more than mine. Um, no. Addressing the psychiatrist, but but as far as predicting the future, uh, let me just say one more thing. Um, I part of uh, what I did, I was at the Library of Congress for a year, a couple years ago, as the chair of astrobiology, and one, one of the projects I did that I that I wrote up as as a part of this book, Earth in Human Hands, was it was called a uh, a short history of the future, where I looked at predictions of the future um, through a, a large swath of history, and predict in particular predictions of now that were written 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And one thing you realize when you do this exercise is that um, nobody uh, can predict the future well. Even really smart people, H.G. Wells and uh, you know, sage, people who we regard as sages who predicted certain aspects of it really well. But nobody gets the game changers. Um, and I think that that will always be true and that I'm not even sure um, being able to predict the future well in total should be our goal, but there are certainly aspects of that that have now become essential as far as those those uh, levers that we're pulling on the Earth. Obviously, climate modeling is important because that's a lever that we're we're pulling. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll never be able to uh, to really predict the future well, but we'll be able to increase our ability to uh, break that down into some um, tangible uh, goals, such as. Um, predicting the, dub the effect on the climate of the doubling of CO2. Things like that we'll get better at. But as far as, I mean, the problem you're, you're addressing really has to do with, with managing ourselves and our behavior, uh, collective behavior, as we, as we get um, more powerful tools. And that, I'm not sure, is even really a uh, problem of science, so much as it is of uh, spirituality and other um, realms we haven't entirely uh, addressed yet in this conversation. Can I, can I say a word about the predictability problem? Um, this actually, at the very beginning, I said, well, here's an interesting thing that it's amazing that above the microphysical level where we think there are these strict laws, that there's anything predictable at higher levels, right? That they should form enough structure that, and, and have enough stability and predictability. In the case of, say, uh, atoms, you put a bunch of atoms together and you get the ideal gas laws, which are very simple, right? Um, and very, very predictive. And it's really important for that that all the atoms are the same, <laughs> or they interact in very much the yeah. same ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the climate is more or less the same thing, but you get because of the flows, it's a chaotic system, and so it's more complicated. But the kinds of predictions we're worried about, which have to do with human beings, that's a whole different ball game because every single one of us is different and every single one of us will re respond differently to our environment and differently to inputs. And you can't have a statistical, mechanical theory that's gonna predict human behavior. Well, I, you never will have because there's too much idiosyncrasy in each individual brain. So there's not the kind of uniformity that's going to allow for such a thing. So I think if you wanted to, pre you know, who predicted the last election correctly? And this is something that it's not far in the future, right? We were all living in this society. It, it had to do with collective psychology. It had to do with all sorts of things that I think are just not ever going to be amenable to strict prediction in any way. So. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry to give you that story, but I, <laughs> that, that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question. I want to propose a major breakthrough in making progress in the way human beings think together by sorting our different ways of being human our different ways of thinking, our different ways of making sense. And what I've devoted my last 50 years to is applying Freud's emphasis on early experiences to that single most important item in all of life. I tease people, can you name me one most important item in all of life? And the answer is, I believe, pretty clearly, the sun. And applying Freud to the sun I would make this proposition 
that the flow of solar energy to us here, let's say in the middle third of the upper half of the planet, goes as a curve, one curve a year, it's something like 200 calories per square centimeter at the low end Christmas time for a whole day to 800 six months later. So we have a solar energy flow that is sort of sinusoidal shape. But the point is this, your birthday turns out to be the phase with respect to that sine curve a fundamental dimension. And so we can make progress if we could rescue birthday away from astrology and its nonsensical premises and approach it more in a Freudian way. We're talking about light and dark, hot and cold. And we can sort humanity usefully so that we can learn how to think together and make progress in a democracy. We can even solve the riddle of justice that it turns out, this is going to be too heavy. <laughs> it turns out that in the Old Testament, and I'm an atheist, but in the Old Testament there is a useful dividing of humanity by 12 in the 12 brothers, 12 sons of Jacob. And in the father's goodbye to his 12 sons, he identifies a lot of traits that I think are important. The kids who are born when it's cold and dark, and it gets colder and darker, he said, you guys have too much murder in your heart. But in particular, one of the sons, the son I believe is born midwinter, he said, you guys are the ones who have the talent for being judges. And when we make you guys the judges, we'll have justice. Voila. So can you imagine approaching the puzzlement that we're <laughs> facing here, the confounding variety of ways of being human, if we could usefully sort them, if birthday <laughs> indeed was a legitimate basis for profound differences in human nature, could you imagine that as a basis for some progress? I guess when I hear that, I think of like ant casts or something like that, you know, the 12, the 12 casts of humans based on when they were born. I mean, I've wondered like whether I was born in November and whether like, okay, I got like a month of going down into the dark, but then it started coming around soon. I didn't get very far in my own head about that. I, I guess, I don't know, I don't think, I think there was something in nature years ago about astrological sorting. I know you're not saying it's the planets, but I, I think it was pretty much debunked. Uh, I'm not saying that the light doesn't have some effect on people, but so does birth order, birth order per parent, personality, siblings, what kind of electronics you're using. It's complex and complicated. It's complex and complicated. So, Okay, next question. Uh, the, the point that you made about the Manhattan Project and how these really smart people uh, came to the conclusion that they needed to be tribal because the Germans would do it uh, if they didn't do it, is an example of even if we have really smart people, they're still going to end up being tribal. Uh, so is there any, any um, example in nature where uh, there are people uh, or uh, organisms evolve from being tribal to being uh, not tribal? Or so? So, so there's a scaling that happens oh. all through human history from small hunter-gatherer groups, uh, uh, Robin Dunbar uh, thinks there's actually a, a neurological correlation that probably the largest group that humans would feel comfortable in based on our brain and, and the complexity of social relations is about 150 people. And then at that point, uh, they it would split. And there are, there are all, there's also sort of archetypal uh, uh, teams like the archetypal team, the band of brothers, it's like the football team, it's 12 or 10 or eight or, you know, but never, never 20, never 30, right? So they're, you know, they're the business unit. So there, there's a, there's a kind of a, a inherited natural scale to human sociality. And one of the great mysteries is how do we scale that up to millions of people, right? You know, chimpanzees could, could not, you know, this many chimpanzees could not sit in the same room together. <laughs> I guarantee all hell would break out, right? Especially so, strangers. Yeah. Is that right? So, 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 you know, how, I mean, how, we're not like a big herd animal. We're, we're intensely concerned about our social relationships. And if they get too complicated, our brains can't deal with it. That's Dunbar's quote-unquote number. 
So, so one of the ways is what part of what I study, which is religion. And, uh, uh, you know, that's one of the ways that we scale up society, right? And we go from pretty egal egalitarian hunter uh, gatherer troops to, to hierarchical groups where there's a minority that, that uh, steals the surplus uh, production to uh, sustain, uh, you know, different hierarchies or whatever. And, and, uh, and what, one of the competitive drives once agriculture comes into play is that agriculture uh, is not a high, high growing productivity economic activity. It gets established and then it's pretty stationary. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get rich quick, the logic is you go invade your neighbors. You steal their livestock, their animal, you kill the, you kill the men, steal the women, make them slaves, increase your labor, increase your land. And so within agricultural civilization, not only do you get things like patriarchy and, and, and uh, you, but you also get a, 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 an economic incentive to militarization. And that militarization, that competition, then drives the spread of all these ideas all around the world and for, for, for good and for bad. So anyway, it's a, it's, it's a mystery that uh, seven billion of us uh, are on this planet right now. It's a mystery and that, we're, that we are, I think, the pinnacle of cooperation mm -hmm. in, in, in evolution. That's how I would frame it rather than the pinnacle of competition. But both have played an, uh, an important role. And, in, and, in and human history. And and to answer your your strict question, biologically there are examples. There's there's this whole um, counterpoint to you know sort of competition and survival of the fittest. There's there's a whole field of biology, soci social biology, where um, uh, there is cooperation at different levels and group selection has led to uh, remarkable um, examples of self sacrifice um, in nature uh, for the good of the whole. And it, it then does come down in some level to to profit. Propagating genes, yeah. I mean, the insects are the are the stars at this, but there's there are other examples as well. So there are biological factors that have pushed in that direction. But as uh, just mentioned, um, human biological capacity does seem to have a limit. Um, fortunately, we are not limited to our genetic. Um, uh, Skills. Um, the one thing that, that uh, in addition to uh, being, you know, uh, uniquely perhaps cooperative species, we're also uniquely adaptable and reinventive species. And um, you know, the world is changing in some ways that um, one can imagine increase our capacity to um, to overcome tribal differences. Uh, global communications. Right now, we're at a moment of possible fragmentation and trying to struggle with some of the effects of connectivity and but that may just be a moment but it, it, it seems as though the trend is for global uh, connection um, and that combined with our innate sociality may be um, may sort of come to our rescue Tyler you want to respond also I'm not I'm fine with it what everyone okay. said yep and related okay. to men's spirituality which can be used obviously for good or for and I would also mention science as um, something that is a global cooperative. Um, yeah, a, and in yeah. fact, almost anything where people come together to seek some goal that's bigger than themselves. I've been a part of some spacecraft teams, uh, you know, and, and very close to people, for instance, on this New Horizons mission that just made it to Pluto. And that's a team of hundreds of people who genuinely, I mean, yes, they fall prey to all the petty competitive, um, you know, uh, motivations that we all do, but there's also this level of self-sacrifice that we're all in this together, that we're all seeking this common goal. And humans do have an amazing ability. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times it's like our army against their army, which is what unites us. But there's that capacity that, you know, faced with the challenges of um, the, really the existential challenges that we're starting to become aware of that um, the uh, that will require some level of global cooperation that one can imagine those capacities being employed on a global level to face those challenges. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up science because you could look at the the history of science and the scientific revolution as being a, a very much cooperativity among these uh, scientists that were in different nations that they they. It, they just transcended that, uh, you know, for the most part. Well, we, we have very little time, so please make the questions brief and the responses brief. Oh, okay. The latter part of your conversation was interesting. It made me think of a book by Frederick Frank, uh, To Be Human Against All Odds. Uh, 
on the ability or the ability of mankind to transcend its reptilian brain, which one has to wonder when we look at the incredible cruelty throughout the world that man still, you know, perpetrates. And I'm not just talking about areas of conflict. We can just look right here at home. We don't have to go that far. But the other thing that was interesting is you mentioned post-enlightenment and our morality, but maybe we need to look at other societies. If we look at the First Nations and their fight it against the Dakota Access Pipeline and having another view of the world, which is not post-enlightenment, but is much more is humane and is considerate of its fellow human beings and of the principle that we don't inherit society, our earth, sorry, f from our elders, but that we borrow it from our children. So maybe, you know, white man's post-enlightenment isn't so... So enlightened? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking as one of the white men here, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to, I, I, the, the, the panel is. This area where we discuss white privilege. <laughs> that last question. Uh, well, I probably should have brought this up when mental structures were mentioned. Uh, being in, from the arts and humanities, uh, there is a big crisis in the arts and humanities because of the increase of knowledge and the changing of mental structures. And this has a tremendous effect on the nature of art and the nature of literature and the nature of humanities. There are a few artists now who are trying something called Gesamtkunstwerk, which is an old term, about trying to unite science and all the disciplines in an art form. And it has its advantages, but only a very few can really unite all the complexity of science and the humanities. And I think it's something to begin to think of. We can't quite go back to the same mental structures in the works of art. Our, our world is too complex. At the same time, individualism is extremely important and must never be forgotten because a work of art does come from a single individual. So I just want to remind you, all of this complexity is very interesting. More of the artists should be listening. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't mean that it's going to have a simple solution. And we are in a crisis now in terms of the, of, uh, the nature and production of the arts. Great comment. Thank you. Great comment. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So